Hello and welcome back to the Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. I'm Gerald Shively, Associate Dean and Director of International Programs in the College of Agriculture at Purdue University, your host for this event. On behalf of the organizing committee, our advisory group, and everyone contributing to this effort, I'd like to welcome you to the forum. I'd also like to thank USDA, especially the Foreign Agricultural Service, for support of this event. This is the second installment of the forum, organized under the theme Farms and Farmers of the Future. In case you are unable to join us on March 2nd for the opening session, those recorded presentations are now available archived on the forum website. The goal of this year-long series of events on the theme of agricultural innovation is to explore the frontier of innovations with a view to feeding the world sustainably. The focus for this session is discovering ways to help farmers everywhere to efficiently produce wholesome products. We have a terrific lineup of speakers, beginning with our moderator, Dr. Ismahan el -Oafi, who joins us from the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome, where she serves currently as chief scientist. Before turning things over to Dr. el to introduce our speakers, I'd like to draw your attention to an important aspect of the forum, one that we hope will be of value to you, specifically networking. As the following slides illustrate, within the Socio app, which we are using for this event, whether you are accessing from a computer or from a smartphone, you will find buttons to open a networking location where forum registrants are listed in a searchable database. Each entry includes as much information as a participant has entered about him or herself. So, for example, you can search the database by country, by crop, by technology, and reach out to others to connect and share your specific interests. I encourage you to take the time to enter information about your interests into the profile summary and to use the database to connect with colleagues around the globe. And now, please join me in welcoming our speakers to the virtual stage. Enjoy the program and please stay for the question and answer session that will follow the presentations. If you have a question for the panel, please enter it in the Q&A feature in Zoom. Good morning, good afternoon, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to this event. We are all aware that the global de demand for food and natural resources is expected to increase to meet the need of our growing world population. The pandemic is further intensifying the stress put on our food system by existing crises such as conflict, natural disaster, biodiversity loss, climate change, pests, and diseases. We have the opportunity to build up to build back better after COVID-19 by adopting a holistic, coordinated approach to work collectively to make food system more sustainable, more resilient, and more inclusive. The, this transformation of the agri-food system is an integral part of the solution to achieve the Global Development Agenda 2030 and to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals that we all committed to in 2015. Such transformation requires innovation to sustainably increase food productivity while building resilience to climate change and protecting natural resources. Let me take this opportunity to highlight some of FAO efforts in developing and promoting open source innovation solution to increase food security sustainable development, and promote rural development. The first example is FAO Hand in Hand Initiative, which is an evidence-based country-led, but also country-owned initiative to help members to accelerate agricultural transformation and sustainable rural development. It is supported by the Hand in Hand Geospatial Platform and the Data Laboratory for Statistical Innovation, 
which combine big data and artificial intelligence for decision making. The second example is FAO initiative that includes the Green Cities Initiative and the Thousand Digital Village Initiative, as well as COVID-19 response and recovery program. These are opportunities for innovation and transformation of agri-food system and for achieving a green recovery. FAO has been using earth observation technology and tools to support member countries to take action in a number of areas, such as the e-locust system to reduce time for analysis to act on the desert locust crisis. We are also using satellite data to detect water stress in advance through the remote sensing tool called WAPAR to monitor agricultural water productivity as well and supporting the action against desertification and the restoration in Africa Green Great Wall Program using Collect Earth, another open source data collection tool that uses satellite imagery to track change in landscape. It is very important to think of innovation more holistically. It is not just about new technologies. It is also about financing. It is about networking. And it is also about new business models. In my mind, innovation should also include the translation of indigenous knowledge in contemporary solution. To be able to reach impact at scale, we must develop new and transformative partnerships. And of course, technologies and innovation must be adapted to the needs of smallholders and combined with a number of other enabling factors. The upcoming UN Food Systems Summit provides us all with an excellent opportunity to work together to ensure that our agri-food system are more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable in order for us to leave no one behind. I would like to thank all of you for your presence and participation, showing high interest in this important topics. And I'm looking forward to the presentation and discussions on ways to design more diversified, more efficient and more resilient agricultural system that optimize soil, plants and animal inter interactions aimed at building synergies minimizing trades off and enabling better adaptation to each context. Let me start by introducing our distinguished speakers today. The presentations will be followed by a 30 minutes Q&A session. Our first speaker is Dr. Agnes Kalibata, UN Special Envoy for the 2021 Food System Summit that I alluded to a bit earlier. She will speak to us on the efficient use of labor and capital, public and private, and enabling policies. Dr. Agnes Kalibata has a distinguished track record as an agriculture scientist, as a policymaker, and a thought leader. Thank you for those introductory remarks, moderator. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Many people say farmers resist change. This is not our experience at Agra. Of the 9 million smallholder farmers we support, 90% have adopted one or more technologies within one season. Across Sub-Saharan Africa, around 70% of the population works in agriculture. These are mostly rural smallholder farmers. While they produce 80% of the food the continent eats, these farmers are among the poorest. For Africa, agricultural growth is still the best means of fighting poverty. There are lots of studies that have shown that growth coming out of the agricultural sector is 11 times more effective at reducing poverty than growth coming out of other sectors. How then can we unlock the potential of Africa's smallholder farmers? Two things stand out for me. We can help them access capital efficiently and promote enabling policies. Africa is not short of labor or land, but there is insufficient capital. Agriculture receives less than 10% of lending. Less than 5% of global investments went to food and agriculture SMEs over the last 10 years. 
we need to change this dynamic to build a more food secure continent. As a result, African smallholder farmers do not have access to the same inputs, support, and technologies that farmers in other parts of the world have. Agri, the organization I lead, was founded by Kofi Annan in 2006, concerned that smallholder farmers were being left behind by the rest of the world. Since then, Agra takes a three-pronged approach to this problem. We are working with the governments across Africa to prioritize agriculture, supporting the enabling environment to benefit smallholder farmers. We are actively working to make it possible for the private sector to provide services to smallholder farmers by reducing the real and perceived risk associated with the agricultural sector. And finally, we are supporting farmers to access technologies that enable them to increase yields and incomes while developing resilience to pests, climate change, droughts, and floods. This sets the stage for millions more farmers to be reached. Since our founding, we have supported farmers, local SMEs, and more recently, governments to build and strengthen critical ecosystems to make African farmers and SMEs more productive, but also more resilient to climate change and other shocks. In this process, we have learned that strengthening systems need to be backed up by functional government policies. For example, the provision of early generation seed is usually driven by government institutions. If they aren't functioning well, it makes it impossible for the private sector to function and farmers to access improved varieties of seeds. If markets don't function, farmers' produce cannot be stored, sold, or processed, and the adoption of improved technologies really makes no sense to farmers. They quickly revert to subsistence farming, which perpetuates the poverty cycle. If these things that we need to drive agricultural transformation at scale are not in place, the sector simply stagnates. Let me paint for you what we are looking for when the agricultural sector is successful. Maria is a 30-year-old mother of six living in rural Mozambique. She was a subsistence farmer who became a village-based advisor, supporting other farmers with extension knowledge. She used to buy maize at the market because she was not able to grow enough to feed her children. Thanks to Agra's support, not only can she grow enough maize for household consumption with supplies to the market, she has moved from being a village-based advisor to an agro-dealer. She has a business. There are millions of smallholder farmers like Maria. What can we do to support them? Agra has learned the hard way that if you are going to be serious about pulling farmers out of poverty, you need to support governments to do their job. This means support to capacity issues that ministries and public institutions face. It means support to timely reforms of policies and support to designing programs that can help reach millions of farmers. At Agra, we call this strengthening state capability, and we consider this area of work to be one of the most transformational in driving scale. Our support comes mostly through technical assistance and grants to deliver on specific bodies of work while building institutions and strengthening systems. We have developed a number of strategies that make capital more accessible to farmers while delivering incentives to the private sector to invest in smallholder farmer systems. This may include making grants to technology suppliers that risk their investments. This may include building delivery mechanisms, for example, agro-dealers and village-based advisors that help farmers like Maria. We have also engaged in designing blended financial instruments that provide innovative products and improved access to capital for smallholder farmers and private sector. But we must also drive for resilience and sustainability for smallholder agriculture. African farmers are stewards of our land. As climate change hits home on the continent with increasing severity, smallholder farmers need to improve their efficiency in the use of resources. For example, in semi-arid areas of Kenya, Agra is working with governments and the private sector to conserve, protect, and enhance natural ecosystems. We're encouraging activities that reduce exploitation of natural resources through expansive agriculture. With the judicious use of appropriate fertilizers and with the right seeds, farmers are able to triple or even quadruple their yields. Ending hunger is a solvable problem, especially if we work with millions of smallholder farmers that are currently producing 80% of the food that is eaten away from the farm and 64% of the food that we are eating in cities. If we empower smallholder farmers to achieve their aspirations, they will attain food and nutritional security, they will steward the environment, and they will send their children to school. If African smallholder farmers become prosperous, they will change the continent forever. So join us as we strive to achieve agricultural transformation on the African continent. Thank you.
Thank you, Agnes, for the insightful words. I'm part of the scientific group that is responsible for ensuring the robustness, breadth, and independence of the science that underpin the summit and its outcomes. And I'm looking forward to continuing to engage with you and the larger community to raise global awareness and commitment and action that transform food system to resolve not only hunger, but to reduce diet-related diseases and to heal the planet. I will now hand over to our second speaker, Dr. Ermias Kebriab, Associate Dean for Global Engagement and also a professor of animal science, science at the University of California, Davis. Dr. Ermias will talk to us about efficient use of inputs for plant and animal nutrition, pest and disease management. He has conducted extensive research in developing strategies for using feed additives to reduce methane emission from livestock and has authored more than 200 peer-reviewed publications. The floor is yours, Dr. Ermias. Hello, uh, my name is Ermias Kabrab. I'm a professor of animal science and associate dean of global engagement at the University of California, Davis. It is my pleasure to speak at this uh, Global Agriculture Innovation Forum. I'll be talking about efficiency use of inputs for plant and animal nutrition, pest and disease management, particularly as, as it relates to uh, smallholder farmers. So to begin with, let's ask the question, what is preventing the efficient use of inputs for plant and animal nutrition and what can be done to improve this? So to give you a, a practical example, uh, we asked uh, smallholder livestock farmers and, and farm advisors in several countries, including in Vietnam, Ethiopia, and, uh, and Burkina Faso. And what we asked them was, so what is their main constraint to increasing their productivity? And what we heard repeatedly from all these countries was that there is a shortage of available feed uh, in, in most cases. But more importantly, what they've been telling us was that there is a lack of information on what to feed animals or how much and when to use fertilizer for crops so that they can improve their productivity. So this is really crucial for smallholder farmers to, to know um, what is lacking and what information that they, they need in order to be able to improve it. So this fundamental question needs to be answered uh, if you are going to improve the efficiency of, of both plants and, uh, and animals. So for livestock, in order to know when and how much or what inputs to use, we first need to understand the requirements of the various types of animals and its corresponding life stages. For example, if, a, if a, an animal is lactating, you don't feed her the same way as you would feed uh, a pregnant animal or you would feed as a dry animal because their requirements are, are different. There are different life stages. And for same, same thing for beef, for goats, for sheep, when, when they are in different life stages, you have to provide the inputs that is necessary to meet their requirement at that particular stage. Um, similarly, we need to know what is in the soil also uh, so that we can provide what is missing when we grow crops. Different type of crops, you know, wheat, barley, and rice, they have different nutrient requirements. So we need to know what is in the soil, how much nitrogen or phosphorus or other minerals are in the soil so that we can maximize the, 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 the yield. I've seen completely degraded soils in Vietnam because inorganic nitrogen fertilizer is being used repeatedly to grow three crops of rice uh, a year. So although they had access to, to manure, uh, farmers prefer inorganic sources because they had subsidy and the belief that it is, it is much better than the, 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 the manure. Although in manure, you have organic sources of nitrogen that would be slowly released in, in, into the soil so that you don't have to put in as much, as, as much uh, nitrogen, but they are mostly dependent on inorganic nitrogen fertilizers and as we know, if there is too much nitrogen that's not utilized, it's going to be uh, leached into the ground or it's going to be converted into uh, uh, nitrous oxide. So there's going to be a lot of loss of, of nitrogen from that uh, system, which, which harms the, the environment as well. So the knowledge of not, not only how much, but also when to apply fertilizers will, will help maximize the, the uh, returns. Uh, crops require inputs such as nitrogen at different stages in, in the season. So to try to match what they need with their requirement would yield a much better return for farmers 
and also help uh, environmental uh, degradation. In livestock, most of the nutrient requirements that we know are, are set using different type of animals. They usually Holstein or, or, or GSC for dairy, for dairy cattle. For example, if you look at the, the, the North American nutrient uh, requirement, it is really set for, for Holstein cows. And there is some adjustment made for Jersey, but it's really based on high genetic merit Holstein cows, which is quite a different animal uh, compared to indigenous animals in, in, in tropical countries. So uh, we need to understand the requirement of indigenous animals and crossbred animals uh, uh, to, to be able to, to, make, to make sure that we can meet that. So to, to do this, we have set up state-of-the-art equipment, for example, to, me to measure dairy cattle requirements in Ethiopia, and we did the same thing for goats and sheep in, in Burkina Faso as well. So this leads me to the, to the second point I want to make, which is developing and using a, a Russian formulation software to maximize the, the feed conversion efficiency and return on, 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 on investment as well. So Russian, Russian formation software have been used for, for decades in, in North America and, and in Europe especially. However, it is no use to have a, a Russian formation software that is not accessible to producers and especially to, to uh, for pharma, uh, pharma advisors. In Vietnam, for example, you know, most extension people have only completed high school and they may have some additional training. So uh, having uh, access to English-based or other European language-based uh, uh, formation software is not going to help them much. And the vast majority, they do not speak English um, or, or use English at all. So the software that needs to be developed uh, needs to be in, in, in the local language. To that end, we've developed software in Vietnamese for, for Vietnam. Uh, in Ethiopia, we are developing the software in the Amharic language, uh, which is the national language of the country. And in Burkina Faso, we're developing this in French. And, and increasingly, farmers and farm advisors uh, have access to, to, to smartphones. For example, Google estimates that 68% uh, of uh, mo mobile phone owners in Vietnam have a smartphone in rural Vietnam. So in overall, it's about 85%. But in rural Vietnam, about 68% of farmers actually have access to this. So, Mobile, mobile applications to formulate diets and, and plan fertilizer applications to crops would really help in efficient use of uh, the, the, the inputs. The third point I want to make is that uh, for smallholder livestock farmers, we need to increase the information on feed resources that are available locally. Um, the standard book values of a variety of forages in particular are based on samples from North America or, or Europe. So they are, they, they are not very well translated for tropical regions. So what, what you grow in one region uh, will be different in another region based on the weather, based on the inputs. So the quality is, is quite different. So the, the chemical composition will be different as well. Uh, smallholder farmers in, in particular, they use a variety of feed, whatever is available to them, without really having an ac accurate knowledge of, of the, the chemical composition of that feed. And the standard way of getting nutritional information is to do a wet chemistry and to determine the chemical composition. But these days, with the wide availability of uh, things like infrared spectroscopy method, a large number of feed types can now be analyzed relatively quickly and incorporated into the uh, Russian formation tools or mobile applications I was talking about earlier in order to make it accessible for smallholder farmers. Um, the fourth point is that feed availability and feed quality affect the efficient growth of, uh, and affordability, in some cases, of uh, animal food sources. Depending on inputs, crops grown for food or, or feed will have different nutritional quality. In some cases, feeds for livestock or inputs for crop production are not available in, in the area. So what the farmer would need to know is if they were to make an investment in purchasing, say, fertilizer or, or concentrate to feed their animals, would their investment yield returns? So without an economic analysis and being able to predict yield accurately, farmers will not be able to risk and improve their life with the livelihood. So this can easily be incorporated into a, a Russian formulation or a crop optimization tool so that farmers uh, or their advisors can run various types of scenarios and simulations and decide 
on options that that max, that maximize their uh, returns. And so the, the, the final point that I want to make is that the, the value of forages and crops in some senses is not really related to their cost, which makes farmers, particularly livestock farmers, vulnerable as they may not get a return on their investment. This is, we see this happening mainly because of shortage of feed and, and farmers are really then forced to buy without any information on the, on, on the quality of what they are purchasing. Normally, trade of inputs, particularly livestock feed, requires nutrient analysis and are sold based on how much energy or protein they provide. There needs to be some sort of a, a standard established so that feed sources for livestock are valued according to their nutritional content. Then the farmer knows how, how, the, how the feed that she or he buys meet the requirements of their animals. So this is hugely uh, then improve the efficiency of with which smallholder farmers can utilize their limited resources. So to summarize, efficient use of inputs of plants and animal nutrition would depend on knowledge of region specific requirements, rush information software, region specific feed, feed availability, and relating feed costs to nutritional composition. Thank you. Thank you, Armias, for that enlightening presentation. Good ecosystem management will build more robust and resilient food production system. Ecosystem services that benefit agriculture include control of pests and diseases, the composition of waste, regulation of nutrient cycle, soil, and water retention, as well as crop pollination. Using practices that increase the use of or reuse of organic nutrients are fundamental. Our third speaker today is Mrs. Yvonne Otieno, CEO of Mionga Fresh Green ENT, who will present to us uh, a talk on optimizing food safety and minimizing food waste. Her focus is in a reduction of food waste through farmer certification, value addition, and market facilitation. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Yvonne Ocheno. I'm from Mionga Fresh Greens. Mionga Fresh Greens is a company that's based in Kenya, and we have been in business for the last five years. Uh, we are a social uh, enterprise business, and when I first started the business five years ago, I started it because I wanted to help women uh, who are mostly uh, who form a bigger percentage of the farmers that are in Kenya. However, as I continued to work with the women and in farming, I realized that about 40% of the thing that the women were actually producing was going to waste. So what this 40% then means is that um, it translates to lost opportunities in terms of the lost income to the families. It also translates translate to lost opportunities for the younger generation because women are known to reinvest about 80% of their income back into the livelihoods of their families. And in addition to that, it also just means the waste of the natural resources that were actually used to grow the product that is in terms of uh, the water that was used it's in terms of all inputs that were used to grow the crop and this problem was just not something that i was facing myself but it's a problem that was across the board so what is the solution when it comes to uh, helping to reduce this waste it became a point point for me because as a company, we just began as farmers five years ago, we only had 1.5 acres of land. And in that 1.5 acres of land, we were just growing French beans. But from growing the French beans, uh, we realized that we needed to have a lot of women working in the farm. And from working with the women in on the farm, I faced two challenges. One of it is that when you have to actually pay the women, what happens is that uh, they have to sign for the payment, but some of the women would refuse to sign and I'll ask why aren't the women uh, signing and also, well, they do not know how to sign. Um, but luckily that solution was solved by having uh, making payments using mobile money payment, which we have locally in the country. And so the second challenge for me was that, yes, I may not be able to do anything about the women uh, not being able to sign, but I can make sure that the business is successful enough and that they can earn an income and then reinvest that income into the livelihoods of their families and help to improve their families. Then the second challenge was that my farm was only 1.5 acres, so what do I do with that? 
how many women can you actually employ in 1.5 acres? And so I had to really think of growing my business and making sure that this woman would have a sustainable source of income. So what we did is uh, we enrolled in a business and I hope that through this, you can start to pick up some of the things, some of the key points that really matter. And one of them is number one, uh, businesses have to be sustainable to make a difference. Then the solutions that we are creating have to be more than just about our bottom lines. They have to be about uh, how we also impact the rest of the community. And the third thing which I'm talking about right now is partnership. So what we had to do was enroll in a business entrepreneurship class. And in the business entrepreneurship class, we were taught different things about how to help our business grow. And within 10 months, the business grew from about 1.5 acres to 10 acres. And then uh, we started exporting directly. But in the process of exporting is where we had to start experiencing more of the waste products. And this is the waste that was going all across our board in terms of not just we as exporters. So what we had to do was think about how do we reduce this waste and one of the solutions that uh, we came up with which has a simple and ready market for the product is to dry the fruits or turn it into powder and that has both local and export demand but we have an additional challenge to that because in africa and just as in many parts of the world fruits are quite seasonal you have seasons when you have fruits that are in plenty and and when when those seas, and, and when that fruit is in plenty, it is um, a lot of that is actually surplus and goes to waste. And then uh, we also have the regional kind of uh, fruits. That means because of the climatic conditions in the country, there's certain seasons where you have seeds, you have fruits in one region, fruits in a different region. So how then do you solve this? Because you either have the factories are either too far from the production centers, which means that there are times of the year that you have idle factories, or you as a company have to incur high logistical costs, which leads to waste, Again, because your prices become uncompetitive, and so you either decide to just leave the fruits in the in the field. So, what sort of solution should one then think of for that type of uh, scenario? So, what we came up with, and this is where the innovation part is quite important, where you work with the communities to see what would work best, is a mobile fruit drying factory. Because drying fruits is, I mean, common almost globally, you have some surplus fruits, you have surplus vegetables, you can try it, you can pickle it and have it stay for longer. But it, because of the seasonality, you, if you're able to actually come up with a mobile fruit factory that will then go from region to region and help to turn these dried fruits into, to, to try these surplus fruits into dried fruits, then you reduce the waste, you help to create employment in the rural areas that is the rural farming areas and this is where a lot of the farm a lot of the waste actually happens and then you also able to reduce the waste in terms of idle factory idle capital investments and the third part of it is actually creating employment in rural kenya because what we do is we make sure that when we have the mobile food factory going round into the different regions of the country we don't move with all our stuff we only have we actually recruit from the rural farming communities who then and work with farming cooperatives who then recommend people within the community that we can train and give them a skill so that they're not just doing um uh, they don't not they're not just producing um raw materials but are actually doing some value addition because when the fruits are dried then they fetch a better price which means you're helping to create our skills within the rural communities and then what it also means is that the fruits that you're having to transport and helping to reduce the climate change effects has 10 times less the volumes of what you're also transporting so that's actually the innovation that we came up with and that's known as uh, willing fruits so it's a mobile fruit factory that will move from different regions of the country depending on the seasonality of fruits and uh, the advantage of having that as i mentioned number one it helps to create employment helps to reduce food waste and helps also to improve your logistical operations as a business remember it is good to help to have impact in the community but if your business is not sustainable then the impact will also not be sustainable at some point you cannot break even the challenge is that usually for such an innovation because it, it was a pilot project it was difficult for us to start out at the beginning because because most people want to see something that's already running. So we had to come up with, a, a, with, we had to send proposals and get partners who are willing to actually help us do that. So for us, the role of partnerships were very, very important.
important. A lot of innovations don't get implemented because those who have those ideas the suggestions do not have enough partners working with them and these are partners in terms of three things and these partners have supported us also as an organization right from the beginning in the last five years we couldn't have done it in our own number one they give you the technical support that you require number two networks that you need that would actually have some skills that you don't have or technology that you don't have number three resource research that's actually very very important uh, because you we will we our goal is to make sure that this kind of model can be replicated, not just in Kenya, but in other African countries where let's say in Nigeria, where we have uh, lots of um, tomatoes going to waste and in other rural communities where they have some unique fruits that literally fall to the ground, but have high nutritional value, but they do not know how to preserve it for longer. If this model can be replicated, it's also very important. And then it also brings in the market aspect because a lot of times the challenge is usually, oh, there's quite a number of research documents that have been done and they're all just lying on the shelf. Then how do you commercial, commercialize it? And this is where for us as a business, it was very important for us to kind of link up with business entrepreneurship institutions that then helped us to make sure that we have a working business model. And when you go to the market, you find out what matters to the market. Three things matter to the market. Number one, they want quality, they want consistency, they want reliability, and the current market has a different kind of interest. They also want to be have the products traceable. We've had cases of people saying they're getting supplies from different African countries or different communities, but you can't trace in case these are the product the recall, you can't trace where the product came from. And that's one of the added advantages we had to leverage on the digital traceability of the product. And yes, that's really very important because uh, I will give the example, like for us, we've had to, we've, we had customers who were willing to buy from us because they knew that, that just by scanning a code, they can tell that this crop has come from a farm that is located in rural Kenya and that the social conditions within which this family that actually produced the farm are being improved because of actually buying this product. So the traceability aspect is also quite important. So 10, uh, five years in business and in all those five years we've had different partners and uh, of the different partners have played uh, all an important role so where are we going as a business what's the next step number one we do have a huge demand still for the products that we are growing, but with the demand also comes the need for certification, whether it is to the US or to Europe, and certification has a huge cost, and the cost of certification needs to be covered, and usually it takes two to three years to get certified as organic. So partners that would help train the rural farmers how to grow the crops in an organic and sustainable way is something that we would obviously be happy to have and, and partner with. Then last but not least, if I right now we're working with about 2,400 farmers and that's just about in three counties. If you're listening to this and you're wondering how can we be a part of what you're doing? Well, we, we our ultimate goal is if we could franchise this and have about 20 mobile factories across the country. And we're happy to work with different partners who are willing to work with us. What happens is that we set up a, a site that we call an aggregation site. On that aggregation site, we have solar powered coolers, solar powered, um, millers as well as the mobile dryer that will then be able to move within that county collecting and drying the fruits to help to reduce the waste so that's how we've worked and those are the innovations that uh, we are currently working on number one a mobile fruit factory solar powered coolers solar powered um, millers that would then work in rural areas. Do we need partners? Yes we are happy to work with you happy to share a little bit more about what we do. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne, for your excellent talk. Food loss and waste has indeed become an issue of great public concern. We know that around 14% of food produced is lost between harvest and retail, and there are significant quantities that are also wasted in retail and, the cons and at the consumption level. Reducing food loss and waste requires the attention and action of all from food producers to food supplier chain stakeholders to food industries, retailers, and consumers. We will now move on to our final speaker for the event, Stefan Ohlenbruck. 
Dr. Stefan is a strategic program director for the CGR program on water, food, and ecosystem. And he will be talking to us about efficient use of water and energy, includes water quality and recycling, and solar power at farm level. Many of Stefan's research and development projects have demonstrated the impact of global change on water cycle dynamics in different hydroclimatic regions worldwide, and they provided solutions to address these challenges. Hi, good morning. Stefan Winbrock here from uh, Colombo, uh, Sri Lanka. I'm the Strategic Program Director of Water, Food and Ecosystems here at IMI, which is part of the CGIR. It's a distinct pleasure this morning to speak to you. Well, honestly, it has been recorded before, but I I'm looking forward to the panel interactions after the presentation. Manage the water we eat. Uh, this, it's about the efficient use of water and energy, one I would like to focus on today in the next nine minutes or so. And at the beginning, I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Dr. Petra Schmitter, who is a research group leader in, on sustainable and resilient food production. It's part of my strategic program. Um, food systems is a, a very important topic, and uh, I, I think I don't need to explain in this audience how, how integral it is and how, how strong the interdependencies are between the different drivers of the food systems. But today, I would like to draw your attention on first on water. And water supply is absolutely critical for the whole food system. It's not just important for the food production, where a lot of water is used, we will come to that, but also in the pre-production process, post-production process, consumption, disposal, uh, etc. So water is actually critical for all the different steps. And the water supply is not just like another input to the farming system, it really is very localized. It is uh, quite an effort to transport it and uh, all, a lot of societal, environmental and economic considerations go into that to ensure proper food supply. The other critical link we wanna to make today is the energy, which in this figure is, is considered as a driver of the food system, but there's plenty of interlinkages between water, food, and energy. I really like this concept of the VEF nexus, which very clearly articulates the, the interdependencies between water, energy, and the food systems. We don't have time today uh, to, to discuss all in detail, but I, I think the key point where I want to make that the development um, of the environment, the sustainable development of the environment, of the people and the economies really very much depend on how this triangle of water, energy and food uh, are, is managed in, in, in a good way. Let me, let me show you two slides on, on, on two key interdependencies. First is water and food. And I, I think it's no news that 70% um, and sometimes more of the water withdrawals are used in the food and agricultural sector. And this can be even much more. If you here see the, the middle pie diagram, it shows that more than 80% of the lower, low and middle income countries uh, of the water, is, uh, water withdrawals are going to the food system. In some uh, agrarian economies, like in Central Asia, it can be more than 90% of all the withdrawals are used for food production. You see a very strong interdependency. Same is for energy. We see here, um, Energy needs a lot of water, and water needs a lot of energy. Um, energy production needs water for uh, extracting fossil fuels, for producing biofuels, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also, we need a lot of energy uh, to to manage water. In this figure, you see the predicted uh, electricity uses of the future, and it's quite remarkable. It is predicted to continue to increase. And it's also interesting to look at where is actually that energy going to? Where, uh, where are we even further increasing um, the thirsty, the thirst of the energy? And what we see is a lot of energy goes in uh, desalination processes. That that's clear, even if the um, technology becomes better and better and more energy efficient. But it's also remarkable that a lot of water is, excuse me, a lot of energy is used for transferring water, for pumping water from water scarce areas to, um, to water scarce areas from water rich areas. At the other hand, we also use a lot of energy for cleaning the water, which is crazy. We know nowadays that we can build uh, energy positive wastewater treatment plants, but we still seem to continue to increase uh, energy use for, for wastewater treatment instead of making them positive and reuse the water, reuse the nutrients, reuse the energy content of the wastewater. In the second half of my talk, I would just 
uh, to would like to introduce five uh, solutions that that are critical in that WEF water energy and food nexus, and, and that that need to be addressed by the innovations that are discussed at this conference. First, first is what I would like to refer is to is sustainable intensification of agricultural production, and there is a lot of scope for that. Just on this one figure, um, uh, I got this data from the FAO. You you, you can see how very different the um, yields are for low and high income countries. And for maize, for instance, can be a, a ton per hectare on, on average in low income countries, while it can be nine tons per hectare for maize in high income countries. Obviously, the climate, the soil, etc., are, are different in different regions of the world. On the other hand, there is possibilities to, even, to, to increase the yield in certain areas. For sustainable in, uh, intensification, quite a number of different methods uh, should be considered. That includes uh, different seeds, um, better economic practices, uh, better land management, inputs like fertilizer or uh, fighting pests and diseases with pesticides, agroecological practices, etc. They can all help to support sustainable intensification. Second point I want to make is irrigation. Uh, irrigation is really one thing that can be key when we, in a sustainable way, want to intensify agricultural production. What you see on this figure is that over the last, uh, what is it, 50, 60 years, the amount, excuse me, the area covered by irrigation doubled roughly, which is a good development if it's done sustainable. But um, the rain fed area more or less stayed stable, maybe slightly increased. And, and that 20% of the land, which is used for irrigation, about 40% uh, of the food is produced. You see that the productivity of that land is uh, almost three times as high as for the rest of the rain-fed agriculture. And so irrigation can produce higher yields, in particular for smallholders in, in a bit um, uncertain uh, climate when it comes to, to uh, rainfall, uh, supplementary irrigation can really make the difference of a failed harvest to a secured harvest and supporting the livelihoods. So irrigation can be one of the solutions. Bad news on this figure, also I really like that figure because a lot of information is combined here. You see the, the gray line in the, in the back and you see the amount of area land available per person. And that has been decreasing quite rapidly over the last decades because the, the population um, increases outpacing our, our development of the resources. So it's, uh, the world has been growing too quickly over the last 50, 60 years, or has been growing very quickly, too quickly. Um, I, 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 I keep that statement for the discussion. Third solution, which I would like to share with you is a better use of groundwater. Um, Often irrigation is uh, less developed in, uh, in, in low income countries or in Africa, for instance, in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa, it's estimated that some five or 6% of the area is used for irrigation. But on the other hand, there's a lot of potential, particularly when it comes to groundwater in many parts of Africa. What my colleagues did here, they were mapping for the whole of Africa, the uh, ir groundwater irrigation potential. And you see that in quite a number of different areas, there's still potential. There's potential to further increase the, um, the, the groundwater irrigation and therefore increase the yields and stabilize uh, agricultural production. Solution number four is to improve the water productivity. Again, I have a somewhat water biased um, view on, on, the, uh, on my, in my presentation today. With productivity, we mean uh, to produce more with a given amount of water. For instance, more yield with a given volume of water or higher income with a given volume of water. So increasing the water productivity can be done through a number of biophysical measures, better, better breeding or biotechnology, better, better agronomic practices, better irrigation, better water storage, et cetera, but also a number of economic and policy instruments um, that can help to increase the water productivity. There's a lot of scope for that. And just, just one example is, is a bit of a complicated figure, which my, my co-author, Dr. Schmitter and her colleagues were producing is uh, demonstrating the value of information. Here, farmers got access to soil moisture measurements and have been better informed about the actual status of the soil and the, the need for irrigation helped to, to, to do that much in a much more strategic and a much more efficient way, and therefore increasing the water productivity. And it was possible to save water, to save fuel, but also to save fertilizer in that respect, 
as well as to increase the yields at the same time. So having more access to information uh, can really make, make a difference. And in the discussion, I'm happy to expand on that in our own field. Also, the neighboring farmers or the farmers in the same areas got access to because of seeing the behavior of the well-informed farmer. They took benefit from, from that information and were also able to increase their productivity. Productivity is a, is a beautiful term and often it's, it's confused with irrigation or excuse me, with efficiency. And I, I really like this, this um, figure about the uh, um, Jeffson paradox, which is, is an analogy uh, in this case for uh, fuel efficiency of cars. Over the last 20 years, the fuel efficiency of, of our uh, cars has significantly increased increased but that not, not necessarily but at the same time having more efficient cars we still increase the resource use the same is true for irrigation in many areas of the world is not conserving water resources it is actually still further increasing the water resources and my last example which i want to share with you today is water storage because of climate change and because of many other reasons it is increasingly important to store water and we can do that in a dam, in a human-built structure, but also in, in natural systems like wetlands, groundwater, soil water, etc. And in a report that we launched just two weeks ago on, on a new integrated storage agenda, we could clearly outline that we already have now a, a water storage gap, and that is likely to increase further. And that is really hampering uh, economic development, hampering um, the food system, uh, sustainable transformation of the food system, and it's really hampering also the, the, uh, the environment. So we really have to, to work through much more integrated solutions for water storage. Ladies and gentlemen, this was my short presentation and I'm uh, very much looking forward to the interactive part of our discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stefan, for that fascinating talk. Our success in addressing water-related challenges in agriculture passes through a much more efficient use of water resources, both in rent and irrigated agriculture. We need to provide greater access for rural communities to renewable energy and consider the importance of biomass, solar, and hydropower as key areas of development. I would like to once again thank all our speakers for those very stimulating presentation. And we now open the floor for questions from the audience. Again, I just thank our four speakers for their excellent insights and presentation. Unfortunately, uh, Dr. Agnes Kalibata won't be able to join us for this debate, but uh, if you have any questions, we could pass them on to her for a later time uh, and connect you with her. So with that, I'm gonna start with uh, the second speaker, Dr. Ermias Kebriab. Thank you very much for your insightful talk. So Ermias, I have a few questions for you here. Let me start with the first one. The positive effect from interaction between crop and livestock grazing based on biophysical complementarity is gaining global attention under the rubric of regenerative agriculture, in which nutrient use efficiency are thought to be enhanced. Do we know enough about the biology of such integrated system to promote regenerative system to family farmers? If so, what policies and support will be necessary for effective knowledge transfer? So I have two parts in the question. Do we know enough? Is it really efficient? And what are the data we know about it? And second, if yes, what policies do we need to put in place to, to transfer that know-how? Over to you, Ermias. Thank you for, uh, for the uh, great question. Um, so I think for, for, for me, uh, when I think about uh, the general agriculture, uh, I think about sort of farming and, and grazing practices that, that, are, that will help in, in rebuilding the, the soil organic matter and restoring uh, degraded soil biodiversity. And this way we can help build up uh, carbon drawdown and, and improving uh, things like uh, water cycle as well. So um, 
this is um, kind of a sort of more or less new type of way of, of looking at things. It's basically really trying to understand about the um, how we can help soil because without the soil, we can't really do much, uh, whether for, for crops or for, for livestock. So uh, to me, it's uh, focusing about how do we build carbon? How do we build organic matter in, in the soil? And so that we can have um, a better yield for crops and also be, have a better uh, water retention capacity uh, and all that. So a lot of work is being done uh, right now. And um, so I, I would say the, the science is settled on, uh, on this. Um, so, so, you know, uh, th there's a lot more to be done uh, in this area and particularly how it is relevant to, uh, uh, to, to smallholder farmers as well. Um, so I, I don't think we are in a stage where we can go ahead with the, with the policy section, but uh, it is very promising. Uh, in, in some cases, it works really well. Um, there's been a lot of demonstrations that show that by building the, the, the carbon stock, by improving the, the, the organic matter in the soil, we are really be, be able to, we are in, in a good way to improving yields and, and also the interaction between, between uh, uh, livestock and, and crop as well. So in mixed crop systems in particular, I think this this will be a, a really sort of game changer, but we need to know a little bit more uh, before we go uh, uh, straight uh, heading into this. Thank you very much, Ermias, because I think it's uh, it's the new buzzword, the regenerative agriculture. I'm I'm glad that you clarified that we do know enough, but there is more that we don't know. So the end knowing it's much bigger, and hence it's an area for research that yes. really worldwide to, to push forward. Let me move to a question for Yvonne, our lady on, on the panel. So Yvonne, in the tropics, and especially in sub-Saharan Africa, aflatoxins from aspergillus species, contamination in grains is a major health problem. It's, it's also limited trade of grains out of Africa in terms of international trade. So the uh, development of AFLA safe soil amendment by IITA and partners appear to be promising to reduce the scourge. What progress has been made in scaling adoption in Africa countries to using these alpha safe uh, soil amendments? Over to you, Yvonne. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I would say, uh, first of all, it's good that there's been a lot of progress in terms of uh, various tests and research that were done to find out what is possible to do and what um, and how to actually help reduce it. I'll say in Kenya, the progress has been really uh, tremendous, but um, a lot of this, let's say, still needs to be well documented and publicized. It's not as well documented and publicized as it should be. So I suppose this is where the aspect of com communication and uh, exchange of knowledge would bring in uh, better in some in better insights in terms of what is actually working and what's not working. So there's still a gap in terms of what needs to be communicated and the dissemination of the knowledge and lessons learned. Thank you very much, Yvonne. So let me move now to Stefan. Uh, Stefan, clearly solar powered tube well irrigation will have increasing benefits for family farmers. But how robust is groundwater replenishment data in developing countries to avoid over withdrawal of water resources? And the second part of the question, how likely will family, farm families be able to sell residual solar power back on the grid to recover costs and encourage water savings? Uh, and maybe if you want to just uh, draw a, a bit of a comparison between Asia and Africa situation. Over to you, Stefan. Thanks, Isman. And I have 45 minutes to answer the question or no? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, we, we would like to have many questions and interactions. Good. Thank you. <laughs> no, you know, solar irrigation is, is fascinating. And um, it's, it's, the initial investment is needed to pump the water. If so it's take groundwater for solar irrigation, you need to invest in the pump and the solar system, et cetera. But then the additional cost to pump more water is actually very little. Um, so it's the initial investment and then continuously pumping 
is the um, there's relatively low cost connected to that. With the disadvantage, then oh, it's cheap to pump. There, then people continue to pump and and overuse groundwater resources, often to an unsustainable way. Quite a number of studies have been done on that, including from IMI, International Water Management Institute in India, but also several African countries on that. So, so it's it's very important to understand the resource that we have, how many in a sustainable way we can utilize, really in a sustainable way, and, and and stay within that limit. So I think that that is the challenge. So what, what are the, the, the possibilities to, to manage that properly? And I think, Isman, you, you brought one point up, and that's um, the excess energy, the, the energy that we from the solar pumps that we don't use for pumping, we can do something else with it. If we are connected as a farmer to a grid, we can kind of charge it, you know, bring it back to the grid and, and, and earn some money. So that's a revenue stream, an additional revenue stream that farmers can have if they are connected to a grid. So these are so-called on-grid solutions. Off-grid solutions are the solutions that actually are not connected to the grid. So we talk about an isolated farmer somewhere not connected to electrical grid, having a solar panel, and he or she usually cannot sell the energy back. Well, you can still charge a cell phone, and I, I was very happy to hear about the, the story with the, um, but it was more than 80% of the rural farmers in Vietnam have uh, cell phones. I think Amir has explained that to us. Yes, it, it's yes. fascinating, but, but, but they also need to be charged and also in, in a kind of disconnected from the grid area. So therefore solar panels, some excess energy is, is still can, can be used for other purposes. Huh? Um, so that's an off-grid solution. So, so it depends on on-grid, off-grid, and now it depends on if we have an on-grid solution, so how high is the tariff? If you make the tariff too high, then it's for the farmer more attractive to sell the energy instead of irrigating the crops and, and, and producing food. So it's kind of earning, earning more money with the selling the energy. If it is too low, then it's also not attractive to, to invest in the solar um, system, to, to invest in the distribution, maybe share with the neighbors, et cetera. So it's really, it's kind of the setting the tariff right, right is, is, is a challenge. And I'm not an economist, but, but I'm sure that there, there a number of studies have been made on that. And it's, it's kind of setting the tariff, it's setting the business model right, making inclusive business models that all members of society, including uh, female farmers, et cetera, have access to such systems. So it needs a lot of careful thinking. So I, I hope I answered most of the question. What about, about the mapping on the groundwater? Do we have enough information, enough technologies to, to assess properly the underground water so we don't get into over extraction? situation over yeah well, yeah well normally no is fun and i think normally we, we do not have enough and we have to say that very clearly and there's this overuse of groundwater is, is a big big problem on the other hand in one of my slides and we saw that there's unutilized groundwater resources as well so groundwater depending on the location can also be part of the solution it can really help in a sustainable way but but locally we often do not have good understanding of the recharge mechanism. We do not have good understanding of the amount of the resources. And there is unfortunately overuse of, of groundwater, uh, very, very common. And we do not have enough data. And we don't have, like, like soil moisture, you can map at least the pattern from the space. But groundwater is very difficult to do with remote sensing. And um, so yeah. we're still lacking good technology. Thank you very much. I, I think that's another area where research is very much needed. Uh, yeah. So I guess move to Hermias. Uh, Hermias, the decentralized feed enterprise in rural towns in Africa have not flourished as well as we see it in many parts of Asia and Latin America. So what do you think are the key elements or innovation that need to be fostered and enabled for more robust decentralization of feed industry capacity in sub-Saharan Africa? Over to you, Hermias. All right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think well, one of the things that um, sort of comes into mind when, when I'm thinking of this uh, the, the decentralization is uh, actually it's sort of the access to, to feedstock, to uh, access to uh, inputs in, in, into, into uh, agriculture. So when you have um, a sort of a community that would actually be, bring all these inputs together and, and have it uh, available to, to farmers in a more centralized way, then you would actually help in, in increasing the, the the productivity, and we haven't seen that much in in Africa, mainly because of uh, the, depending what what areas you are, 
Um, uh, for example, we were working in, in, in Burkina Faso, and we see that the, if you look at the, the, the map, the, the feed map, in one area of Burkina Faso, there is ex excess feed available for livestock, while in other areas, it, it's not. And you could think that you know people can take advantage of that and have a, a um, sort of um, a system in which that they they could bring in from from the areas where there's more feed to the areas where there isn't. But because of the what's happening with in terms of war and being been able to access to those different areas, that there has been that kind of limitation where you cannot really be able to to to, to do that. So uh, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of constraints in, in a lot of uh, small other communities uh, across Africa that will prevent from having uh, for, from having that. Um, but I think, uh, as, as Stefan was saying earlier, information is, is key. I think uh, providing information to smallholder farmers is, 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 you know, really the way to try to, uh, to get out of the poverty and also improving the, the, the yields. And, that's exactly what the kind of thing that we are doing with the, with, with this work with, with the feed of the future. Uh, in Ethiopia and, and, and Burkina Faso is to uh, figure out where is the feed, what, what is available, where is it available, and then once you know that, then you, 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 you're able to um, use that information to uh, make sure that you, you put together a, a formulation of diet for, for livestock so that they meet their requirements, you increase their, their productivity, you, you do a ration formulation based on what's available there, and, mm -hmm. and then you could also have information, you know, if people are able to import uh, feed or w whatever they need to import for, it could be for crops and for, for livestock. And if they know what the return is going to be, um, then they, they they will be encouraged to to, to invest in, in that. But if they are being charged X amount of uh, thing for a an improved uh, fodder or a concentrate or a, a fertilizer, but they don't know what the outcome is going to be. I think it's a, it's a lot more risky business to do that. But if they actually have the information, you know, okay, the, the price of milk is this much, you know, the price of corn is, is, is this much. So if you um, pay for fertilizer, if you pay for feed, then this is this is how much you're going to get uh, at the end of the day. So that makes it a lot easier to, for farmers to have that information and be able to implement it. And, and then they, they can increase their, their productivity, pay off uh, what they need to pay for, for the uh, extra inputs in, into the system. And, and then they build on top of that. So I think I, I really, you know, it speaks to me when I when I saw Stefan talk about the information and the water uh, and how how it improves the, the yields. That's exactly what we see in the in the African continent as well. But I mean, is, is that the role of extension services and ministries of agriculture in those countries that to provide that know-how and that local data to the farmers? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I think the extension services are you know, extremely important in, in disseminating this uh, this area. So uh, in some places, I wouldn't expect people to uh, be knowledgeable of all the, the, the technology and how to do a Russian formulation, all that kind of stuff. But there is a way to provide this to the extension agents that makes it a little bit easier as well. So we, we've done this, for example, in Vietnam, where most of the extension agents were, were not able to speak in English. But, you know, they, they don't have that, that level of education. So all the so far all the, the Russian formation software that was developed was all in Vietnamese. And once they have that information, they were able to go into the field and help farmers to, to, to let them know, you know what they need to do and what's available to them uh, much easier. The same thing in, in Burkina Faso, put it in French, in Ethiopia, we, we use it in, in Amharic and hopefully more languages as well. And so that way it's accessible to, to the extension agents and the extension agents feel much more empowered to go and help uh, farmers as well. Thank you very much, Hermias. I'm going to move to Yvonne. Yvonne, uh, you have described Mionga to be a social enterprise business. So I think many people, we don't understand what does it mean. So could you just give us a bit of uh, more understanding how different it is from a profit business than for uh, a social enterprise? And also by the same way, how could we encourage businesses to focus on the social contract and become more a social enterprise business? Over to you, Ivan. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, simply put, a social enterprise business is a business that puts people before profit. 
It's a business that looks at what solutions, what are the problems that the sub community has and what solutions can we actually bring out to, uh, to help solve these problems. A social enterprise is a business that just looks beyond uh, the profits. And when I say people before profits, it's when you try, when as you're working on your business model, the traditional business model is always to make sure that a company is always making more profits and increasing their profits throughout as it grows. And obviously most of all, but then a social to what are the long-term impacts or long-term benefits to that particular community. Let me give you an example. Uh, and it's the same example that I gave earlier. You're in business, you're trading in fresh fruits and vegetables. When I go to the farm, I only pick all the fruits that are good for export or good to actually process. What then happens is that anything, and of course, because most of our farmers are not using uh, irrigation or modern technology. So you will not find that all their fruits are growing uh, in the same kind of size or the same kind of weight. I mean, because most of the farms that are actually using such technologies can actually control it right up to the size and the diameter of the crop. So what then that means is that I will only select the fruits from the farm that meet my market specifications. Those that don't meet my market specifications are left to the farmer. And that's where the waste goes in. And that's about when you go to the farm gate level, that's actually about 80% of those don't actually meet that specification. As a business, as a pure business, all I would think of is, wow, I have what I need. I can move on, sell, and go and collect fruits elsewhere. But as a social enterprise, I sit back and think, what happens to the 80% that this farmer has not sold? Well, it's left in the farm. It rots. Um, I mean, I'm sorry for the farmer. But I would go further and think, what does that 80% mean? What it does mean is one, this farmer has invested a lot of their time, a lot of their resources. They've used the natural resources we're talking about, preserving the water, if they put any additional inputs into that. And at the end of the day, they're actually going to make a loss. What then that means is the loss is more than just um, the resources that they've put in. It also, we now go and look further and see, what does that loss actually mean to the farmer? It means, and, the income that they were expecting to reinvest in the lives of their families in terms of investing in the education of their children, investing in ensuring that they have proper health access and just improving the general livelihoods of their families, including how they will buy solar panels to light up their own homes and actually seen lamp or a charcoal lamp. So you go beyond just the profits that we would make from the products that we get from the farmers to look at what impact are we actually having in the farmer. So it means that part of our profit being of the farmers, part of our profits, part of our resources are invested into coming up with innovative solutions that would help reduce these challenges that are facing our community. Because at the end of the day, what happens if these children are not educated? What happens to the whole sort of lot in terms of the country's GDP? What happens is that you get a situation where you have dependency and you're always depending on aid. So that's where the, where we're not just looking about the people who are involved in making sure that the business is sustainable. The second thing is you're not just looking at what you can get now, but you're also looking at the business for the future. How can you be sustainable? So you're looking at also the environmental aspects and what it means when you have waste of resources. You're looking at what are the, are the, are the partnerships. You're also looking at the business environment that you're working in. Who are the partners that you have around you that could actually help solve the problem? Because as a business, again, you can't solve all the problems, but if you're within a network and you have partners, then you're able to access the technology, the knowledge or the skills that you as a business might not have on alone. So it becomes more like a network of different people working together to solve the, the problems that our community are facing. So I hope that answers the question number one people before profits. Number two, long-term impact, sustainability. Thank you very much, Yvonne. We, we, we lost you once in a while, but really the message is there. I like very much the motto, people before profit. Uh, and I hope that resonates with people in business at large. So let me give one last round of questions to the three speakers. Uh, but before, Stefan, you talked about the potential of irrigation in Africa. Could you expand more on it? And maybe uh, also touch up on soil conservation measures uh, to be used as well to, to increase water efficiency. Over to you, Stefan. Uh, thanks. Uh, good question. 
Um, well, there, there's still a lot of potential. I think in total, if you look at sub-Saharan Africa, there's probably five or six percent of the areas irrigated. The others are, are rain-fed. Um, as we know, as soon as we irrigate, we can stabilize and increase the yields quite quite dramatically. Uh, so there, there's a lot of potential. I believe in the earlier question you had, I, I should have said something about a comparison between Asia and Africa. And when it comes to solar, as, as solar powered irrigation is certainly something very attractive, and one also, also connected to that. I saw, saw a figure, I um, need to look up the source, where, where the market for solar power irrigation was compared between India and Africa. And in India, it has been taking off dramatically over the last five to 10 years. You know, it's really very massive increase. And it's expected a further increase, and there's still a need. But if you, you don't compare that with the expected exponential increase of the market for, for Africa. So there, there's a lot of potential and uh, needs. And obviously, as we said before, the sustainability for groundwater, but also sustainable for the people and all members of society, all people even, uh, the preferred profit, but also all people uh, should, should have access to, to the technology and, and should have access to, to actually implement that. And so there, there's a lot of challenges to, to do that right from setting the right policy framework. Second question you said um, about is there soil conservation? What is the potential there? I, I think in general, particularly if we have an increasingly erratic climate, increasingly uncertain climate due to, to climate change, um, storing water is, is very important. If we can store it in the soil to make it accessible for the, um, mm -hmm. for the plants, this is certainly a good solution. Therefore, soil, soil and water conservation measures are, are certainly helpful. Also, so slowing down the flow, infiltrating water into the ground and make it accessible for plants later is, is certainly um, a technique that, um, that was well practiced already some thousands of years ago in some regions of the world. <laughs> and, and it got a bit forgotten sometimes, but, but uh, there's, there's potential for, for doing that. And if I may, one last example, which I found really fascinating, it was from Ethiopia. And it was a study done by, by our colleagues from Barida University together with Imi and, and some others. And, and, and they were looking at, you know, farming in Ethiopian highlands is, is very difficult. There's steep soils, very thin soil cover, very rough to, 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 to make a living as a farmer there. But um, they, they were looking at shallow groundwater in the soil. So often when we talk about groundwater, we think about big groundwater bodies in the alluvial aquifer systems. But we're talking now about temporary, very shallow groundwater, one or two meters deep in these sloping Ethiopian um, mountains. And it was fascinating to see that um, there's a model behind it, and they were estimating the assess. But, but in many, many areas, you, you could at least irrigate crops for, for up to 100 days a year. And that can really, at the end of the raining season, when you really need, need, need some, some rain for the crops, but there's a dry spell. And unfortunately, these dry spells come often and often more often because of climate change, that can really help to secure the crop. So the supplementary irrigation on, on these shallow groundwater systems, which is only temporary perched aquifer systems, uh, can, can really be very, very helpful. So I found that an interesting, uh, a very interesting study that, that could help um, many, many uh, farmers in, in mountainous areas. So irrigation does not necessarily need to be big and uh, in the alluvial fans, but it can also be something for the hill slopes. And here, soil and water conservation measures together are, are part of the solution. Thanks. Thank you very much, Stefan. I can't agree more with you. Small scale irrigation particularly have saved big portion in, Af in Asia, and we are not using it enough in Africa, although there is a huge potential. So maybe for the three speakers, I have one last uh, uh, question for all of you. And maybe if every one of you want to take not more than one minute, maybe 30 seconds to one minute to reply. So how can we enable better alliances among public and private sector partnership to improve input use efficiency? So the input, it's really a private sector. It's run by private sector across the world. How could we really improve the efficiency between the two? And I'm just told that we have only two minutes, so make it 30 seconds then. Stefan, we start with you since you are on, on the podium. Please go ahead. Uh, thanks. D difficult. I, I think facilitating these multi-stakeholder platforms is important where, where private, public sector and all other stakeholders, farmers, extension service, municipalities, different, different levels of government are, are part of that, that platform and facilitate that along the food chain, but also along the, the input supply chain. 
so, so uh, fertilizer, irrigation um, uh, technology, et cetera. So really looking at both chains and, and bringing, bringing these stakeholders together and it needs a con constant facilitation. No silver bullet, but it is. Thank you. We're gonna move to Yvonne. Yvonne, any ideas on how could we improve the alliance between the two, private and public? So I would say having such a forum is actually one of the best ways to start because it's in such forums that people like I get to learn what Stefan is doing, we get to learn what's happening in, in Asia, we get to learn from different panelists as well as participants. And that knowledge exchange and that information, that learning is extremely important because I believe that information is the most power tool that we have. And right now with access to mobile technology, it just shortens the gap between who you can find where access to the internet and actually just reach out to them. So the first is the attitude of learning, having such forums, and then opening up to new ideas by just being ready to share as well as uh, learn from others. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. And Ermias, over to you, please, for your <coughs> idea. Alliance. Yeah, I, I agree to totally what uh, Yvonne was saying uh, was saying earlier and from from my experience. But what what we try to do with this uh, see the future um, uh, initiative is to bring uh, the public, the, the, the private sector, together with uh, with with scientists and with uh, with farmers and all that, so that they can actually talk to each other. They can actually understand from each other. They know what information is is out there. And so I think bringing this, the, the private sectors and basically saying, you know, this, this is the challenge, this is what we have, and we need you to help us solve X, Y, and Z. And, and so the, the private sector will actually will understand more what is what is needed and, and they, were, they were able to put their efforts in, into that as well. So I think having this connection, uh, continuous dialogue between the private sector and, and, and public is, is extremely, extremely important. Thank you very much, Ermias. A really thank you to our three speakers. Uh, just a few key messages from my side. As we have seen for agriculture system, the agriculture system needs a number of inputs to be productive, but this input needs to be not only available, they need also to be used efficiently and in a sustainable manner. Uh, as our speaker have highlighted, this pertain to feed for livestock, production, but also to water, energy, and methods to reduce loss and waste. The next forum event will focus on ways that innovation in agriculture can help us be more sustainable and climate smart. So I hope you're gonna uh, join that discussion. The really key message I'm hearing today from the four speakers, also Dr. Agnes Kalibata, is the need to support farmer through providing access to finance, access to know-how, access to technology, and access to market. And really, we heard really stories from both Agnes and Yvonne explaining to us how those access to these four things, finance, technology, know-how and market could make a huge difference in the life of people. I also, other key messages that I think are very important is that there are a lot of technologies out there, be it on the feed, on the ratio calculation, be it on the water, be it on the reuse of waste and recycling and, and so on and so forth. But really there isn't enough, it's not translated in a way that the farmers are able to really take it on and adopt it. And that's where the power of digitalization, the power of artificial intelligence, it's very important and we need really to, to really use it properly to make sure that the farmers can access it, can use it in, in order for them to improve their incomes, improve their productivity, improve their incomes, and improve also their nutrition. We haven't touched enough on nutrition, but I think it's very important as well, particularly when we talk about least income countries in view of the huge malnutrition rates that we have. We touch up on climate change as well and the need really to store water because the future is gonna be hotter, the future is gonna be worse than what we have right now and of the huge potential for irrigation in Africa, be it particularly focusing on small scale irrigation. Uh, so with that, I think we had a fabulous discussion. We have fabulous four speakers, very gender balanced, two women and two men. So I would like really once again to take, thank our speaker for those very stimulating presentation. And now we will have to close, although we went a few minutes beyond the time. Thank you very much for your attention and it was a really pleasure to see you all 
today with us.